Again, I'm Ellen Perella. I work with Charity Sweeney, the other certified athletic trainer, and Katie McMadden. McFadden is our um, grad assistant from Springfield College. We work with our um, athletic training aides for all certified EMTs. We work with um, student athletic trainers from Springfield College and from Westfield State University as well. And we are all, um, our job is to try and take care of you, the health care of the athletes, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation of, of injuries that are incurred um, in and out of season. So a few things to go over. Our hours, we're open Monday through Thursday, 10 to 12 in the morning, and 2 to 7-ish in the afternoon, in, at night, whenever we're done. For Fridays are a little bit different. We open at 2. Most of the teams practice a little bit earlier, so we're usually done about 6. But basically, we're done when, you, when you're done. Um, and for games, the tip, depending on the, the sport, but typically we open two hours before a contest. Um, there are a few teams we can get, open up an hour and a half before a contest, so that's typically on a, on a Saturday that I would be talking about. Some training room, athletic training policies, leaving cleats, backpacks, sticks, et cetera, et cetera, outside of the room so it doesn't get crowded. Understand how important it is to report all injuries to the athletic training staff, all right? I ask you not to try and self-diagnose or self-treat um, if something is bothering you, simply come in to see us and we'll help you take care of it and get rid of it. Um, and the sooner the better. You know, it's a lot easier to get rid of your aching knee that's been bothering you all day versus a knee that's been bothering you for three weeks. Um, as healthy athletes are obliged to report to practice, injured athletes have the same responsibility to report to the athletic training room. Um, and we will be doing your treatment, we'll be doing any necessary rehab, and if you're not able to participate in your sport due to your injury, we, we try and find other activities that you can do to try and keep you in shape until you can return to your team. Um, sign in on the daily treatment log, which is on the island when you first walk into the athletic training room. Um, and be aware that athletes are responsible for, if you have an EpiPen or an asthma inhaler or anything like that that you need for a medical condition that you have, you are obligated to bring that to every practice and, and contest. Some safety and health considerations. I think the number one safeguard against injury is reporting to your tryouts and practices well conditioned. All right, you need to be physically prepared for the rigors of your sport, um, which helps to minimize your risk of injury. I think, you know, basically it's a year round thing now. I mean, staying fit, staying strong. Um, it's not something that you just try and do when your season crops up. You really need to do it throughout the year. Other precautions that are important in taking care of your body are a sensible nutrition plan. I'll talk a little bit about nutrition. Getting enough sleep is really essential as part of your recovery process. Um, and not smoking or abusing drugs or alcohol, obviously. What I try and impress upon people is that I want you to understand that your actions have a direct impact on your health, on your performance, and on your susceptibility to injury. Okay, so you, do, you play an active role in this. So heat and hydration is my first talk, and on the, it's a concussion on the back of that. Some of you have color, and some of you have black and white. So I realize that my urine chart is not very helpful if it's in black and white. Um, so sorry about that. So this, the special athletes have the color ones, and the rest of you have the black and white. No, just kidding. But I, um, you will start seeing these in color, and they're just going to appearing in um, restrooms and stalls and in your locker room, and I'm going to get a large poster in the athletic training facility. But the bottom line is that your, the color of your urine and the volume of your urine basically tells you precisely what your hydration status is or is not, okay? Um, so please pay attention to that. It's kind of a foolproof way um, to tell if you're hydrated. So the, although the fact that this is black and white is not helpful, the, the basic gist of it is the lighter, your, um, the less concentrated your urine is, the lighter in color and the higher in, volu higher in volume, the better off you are and the more hydrated you are. And as it gets darker and darker, you can see um, that really starts telling you that you're dehydrated, which affects your performance, number one, and two, um, so certainly affects your ability to handle the heat and really puts you at risk for heat illness, okay? Um, so, you know, by and large, dehydration and heat injury is 100% preventable. Um, you need to bring all athletes, basically, I know we have a variety here, but you should be bringing a quart-sized 
filled water bottle to every practice, all right? And depending on your venue, we have water available to refill your water bottles, but you should be bringing them already filled and just use our water to refill it. There's handouts here if you're coming in late, or you can ignore me, and or yeah, right there. Um, so signs of dehydration, heat injury are thirst, headache, nausea, weakness, dizziness, um, confusion, cramps, as I said, decreased performance is going to happen before you even ever get a heat illness. Um, it can lead to lack of sweating, can lead to altered mental status, can lead to unconsciousness, can lead to death. Um, you know, you have heat cramps, you have heat exhaustion, and you have heat stroke. Um, heat stroke being the most serious, where your body has just lost the ability to really get rid of the heat that is producing, which is via sweating primarily. Um, your, your body literally runs out of fluids and the, heating mecha the um, cooling mechanism shuts down and your core temperature now starts to climb, okay? And that's heat stroke. And that has a 70% mortality rate, all right? It's serious stuff. Um, so I can't emphasize staying hydrated enough, okay? Nutrition. Um, and, it, you know, I could go on and on, but I want to understand some, you to understand some basic concepts. Food is fuel, all right, and your body is basically going to request fuel every four hours or so um, in, the term, in terms of hunger, okay. So fluids I've already talked about. Um, water is, is perfect. J fruit juices are good. Milk is an, and chocolate milk are excellent sources of fluid and protein, a great recovery drink. That's, that's kind of another story. Um, complex carbs, let's talk about carbohydrates for a minute. These are all your grains, your breads, your rice, your pasta, your cereals, and your fruits and vegetables. You really want to try and go for whole food, whole grains, and it's your body's number one choice for fuel, okay? It's the gold standard for fuel. So if you're an athlete, a low carbohydrate diet it tells you right there is pretty stupid, okay? You don't want to do that. Um, it's also your best source of fiber, vitamins, nutrients, minerals, um, and everything else. So that's a huge food group, and you should be getting a lot of calories in that food group. Fats um, take a long time to digest, so you don't want a meal that's heavy or high in fat just before a practice or competition. Um, so you want to limit your amounts in that sense. Desserts, mayonnaise, certain meats like bacon, sausage, hamburger, luncheon meats. Um, However, you should also understand there's a group of healthy, quote unquote, healthy fats, your omega-3s and 6s, um, which is really important to include in your diet and should be done so on a daily basis. Common sources there are um, avocado, salmon and tuna, olive oil, nuts, flaxseed. Um, you should try to include those in your diet. And protein, last but not least, is in a very important food group. Um, often neglected in vegetarian and weight conscious athletes, uh, it's utilized for rebuilding and repairing body tissue. And sources are, you know, meat's the big one. And I, I will say that meat based iron is much more readily absorbed than non meat sources of iron. That's why um, anemia is much more common in, in vegetarians. Uh, so, legumes, nuts and seeds, tofu, dairy products meat, poultry, and fish. And you should basically, you want to balance it every meal. You want some carb, you want some protein, you want some um, fats at, at every meal, okay? So that's nutrition. Blister prevention, again, depending on your sport, it may or may not be a big deal, but just a few words. Certainly if you have new shoes, you want to break them in gradually. Don't wear them for the first day of practice. Break them in beforehand. Use powder or skin lube on high friction areas. You may know that you yourself are prone to getting blisters on the ball of your foot or the back of your heel. So take precautions. Um, it is best to wear socks that are not cotton, that are actually like Cool Max or poly, um, poly, poly, polypropylene. Um, though they absorb the sweat and wick it away from your body and keep, your, keep the foot drier. So they are more expensive, but they go a long way to preventing blisters. There's handouts down here. They need to come, come grab. Okay. Contact sports. So we have a few here. So just some, if an athlete goes down and is not moving, thrown off a horse, falls down on the field, don't try and pick them up or turn them over and help them up. Get, get help. Where's, okay, no, 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 right here. 
Okay. Okay. Um, so it and it depends on the situation whether it's calling um, one nine one one if it's a campus phone or relying on your athletic training aid if they're up at lacrosse. But be careful about trying to assist someone who may have a spinal cord injury because you can make it a lot worse. Players who need corrective eyewear must wear contacts or polycarbonate sport goggles and not street glasses. Okay. Um, a few exceptions, depending on your, you know, if you want to row with street glasses, go right ahead. But for the most part, if there's any kind of implement or ball or contact involved, you do not want to be playing with street glasses. Okay. Um, jewelry um, is in accordance with your specific sport. Every sport has different rules. The athletic training staff advises you not to wear any jewelry um, for any practice or competition. Um, I've been amazed that some of the unique and clever ways people can get hurt. Um, for example, I used to, for swimming, I had a swimmer on the diving blocks and, and then dove in and her ring caught on the diving block as she, as she went to dive in. Um, and luckily her ring did break, but her, her finger was in injured pretty good too. So you would th sports that you would think would be safe to wear jewelry, maybe not so much. So it's just the safest to, to not wear any jewelry. That's our recommendation. Um, if you're outside, be careful with wearing perfumes or anything that is perfumed, hair mousse or perfumes, um, to decrease your risk of being stung by a yellow jacket or a bee. Um, if there's any bleeding, you need to immediately have that taken care of and covered. Um, remove yourself from the practice and, and get that taken care of. Concussions. So you have a few, to, to, back, to go back to heat, before I start on concussions, you have some great handouts which really speak to recognizing the signs and symptoms um, and there's different steps you can take in addition to hydration to preventing heat illness, all right? Um, so I don't want to necessarily take the time to read them to you, but please do look through this. Um, but here, drink it, don't pour it. Water is a lot more effective in your body than on your body, okay? Um, and there's, there's all kinds of good tips here, recognizing dehydration, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. But they're, they're all related. So I gave you many, <laughs> you can see I really don't want to be dealing with heat illness, so I've given you three handouts. That's how important that is. All right, concussions, which is the top, top one. Um, and again, this is what's going around. So there's one for each team, and there's one that's kind of like miscellaneous teams. Make sure you are signing and printing your name on one of the um, sheets that's going around that says you heard my little spiel on concussions, which I'm about to do now. Okay, the NCAA mandates that we do this annually. All right, a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury is a complex pathophysiological process that affects the brain. Come on in, and there are handouts right here. Induced by a traumatic, okay, so not illness, but traumatic, trauma-related, uh, biomechanical forces secondary to direct or indirect forces to the head. It can be indirect. It doesn't have to be a direct blow to the head. Okay. Disturbance of brain function is actually related to neurometabolic dysfunction rather than structural brain injury. Concussions are very common, um, and every concussion, no matter how mild, is, is an injury to your brain. Um, so we take them pretty seriously. Uh, the long-term implications of concussions are still not really understood, but we are understanding more and more that each concussion needs to be taken really seriously and that the cumulative effects of concussions um, are, are very significant, okay? And recovering from a concussion uh, requires not only physical rest but cognitive rest because it is the brain. Symptoms, 75% um, of people experiencing a concussion have a headache. So you don't have to have a headache to have a concussion. Difficulty concentrating is also a very common um, phenomena. Fatigue and drowsiness, dizziness, feeling like you're in a fog, uh, feeling like you're slowed down. Light sensitivity or um, hearing sensitivity often comes a little bit later. Balance problems, difficulty with memory, and nausea and vomiting are all possible. You certainly do not have to lose consciousness to, to sustain a con concussion. Prevention, um, equipment, and proper uh, technique in, in your relative sports. Neck strengthening can be helpful. We're trying to include that in, in um, your team strength training program so that 
your neck's a little bit stronger and that can help as well. Um, what's really important is that and you're, when you sign this, you're also agreeing, not only have you heard me speak about concussions, but that you agree that if you think you have a concussion or suspect that you might, or you have a teammate that you're concerned about, um, that you're going to let the athletic training staff know. All right, And that is really critical because if you sustain a concussion, there's a, a, a period of time afterwards beyond the beyond you experiencing symptoms, beyond that period of time, that you are susceptible to a second concussion. Um, and it will take less of a blow, a blow that might not normally even register or cause any problems. But if, you haven't if your brain hasn't fully recovered from the first concussion, you can get a second concussion. And now we're, you're looking at the kissing the season goodbye, all right? Whereas one concussion is a matter of days often. So trying to hide a concussion doesn't usually work out very well and you're really putting yourself at risk. Um, so again, if you, or you suspect that you yourself or someone else on your team that is acting differently or complaining about headaches on the side, let, let one of us know so we can help them. Um, so a couple points I want to make. No, as I said before, no direct contact is necessary. It's kind of like the egg analogy. Um, if I shake the egg, I can break the yolk, I can damage the yolk because the, and that's the same thing with your brain encased in your skull. I don't have to necessarily have direct contact. Um, you need to understand that helmets have limited capacity to protect the brain. So don't have a false sense of security because you're wearing a helmet. Um, again, it protects the eggshell, the skull, more than the brain itself. Um, the magnitude of impact is not necessarily related to the severity of the injury. I've seen some um, really long lasting concussions from what I would have thought was not much minimal impact. And often those people do have a history of concussions. Women as well as younger athletes have an increased incidence and prolonged recovery. MRIs and CT scans are usually normal. Okay, so going to the ER and having that testing done and coming back with a doctor's note that says you're cleared and ready to go means nothing to me. Okay. Um, and understand that the cumulative and chronic effects of concussions um, are, are really considerable. So that basically when you have three or more concussions, your risk of early onset Alzheimer's and depression is three times greater than someone else. So that's substantial and that's lifelong. Um, so make sure you all sign that form. Again, this is, this is a good handout from the NCAA, so take a look at it. Um, some of these things I have already mentioned. Impact testing we do with our athletes that are at a higher risk of concussion. Um, it's, it stands for Immediate Post-Concussion Assessment and Cognitive Testing. It's basically a research-based software um, utilized to evaluate recovery after concussion. So it makes us, it enables us to make a more intelligent return to play decision, okay, with the, um, so a lot of lacrosse and, 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 and EC team um, will be taking baseline tests before you even start practicing or playing. And then if you do sustain an injury, we, we can compare that to the, ba to the baseline. Okay. All right, a few words too on MRSA. MRSA stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus auroris. You'll need to know how to spell that for, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's a staph infection, infection that is highly resistant to antibiotics um, and it's becoming more and more of an issue. If left untreated, it can be limb and life threatening, okay? Because uh, it, it can really just spread like wildfire. It can be spread by person to person contact. It can be spread by sharing towels, soaps, razors, and athletic equipment, okay? So no sharing. Um, the symptom is going to look like skin infection, all right? It can look like a pimple or a boil or a pustule and it's going to have all the signs of infection. It's going to be red, swollen, certainly tender and painful. Um, there may be some pus or drainage. And, and the most common areas is, are areas of the body where there's um, not so much air circulation, groin, armpits, in between the buttocks. Um, so it, basically, if you th suspect, you, you, ha you notice something on your body, come see us um, and, and we're the health center and get it checked out, you know, right away, if there's any question. Prevention, 
Washing your hands regularly is huge and is actually going to prevent a whole lot of things, okay? Um, for example, if you, like we just did yesterday, if you're lifting in the weight room, you know, we don't wipe down every dumbbell and handle after every class and team uses the weight room. That's all we'd ever be doing if we did that. So you need to wash your hands before you go in and you wash your hands when you're done. Um, and that's true for a lot of circumstances, practices. Wash your hands before, wash your hands after. Actually, wash more than your hands after. Try taking a shower. That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, showering. No open wounds in the whirlpools or practice. So if you have something that's opened, it should be covered, and we, we can certainly help you with that. Um, again, be really careful about sharing towels, et cetera, um, and keeping equipment clean and keep, keeping any skin lesions covered. Okay. Some other um, suggestions. I know we have some indoor sports here, but wearing sunscreen, unless you are into sunburn, skin cancer, and premature wrinkling. Um, ankle sprains, if you've had a significant ankle sprain in the last year, um, you should probably be consulting with the athletic training staff whether or not you need bracing or taping for your season, because the, um, the odds are that you should um, have bracing as, as well as, as rehab. Understand that a tight muscle is a tired muscle, okay? Um, it's often the first sign of a pulled or a, a pulled muscle or a strain. Um, the biggest misconception is that people will try and stretch it out. People come up to me and say, Ellen, my hamstring's really tight. Can you show me a good hamstring stretch? No, I can't. I could, but it's not going to help. Um, it's probably getting tight because it's getting injured. You're either overtraining um, or it's just really tired and is susceptible to being strained. So stretching, stretching away pain or stretching away um, a specific tightness is usually not a, a good idea. So see, see us about it and we'll help you take care of it. Okay, trying to stay awake. I'm almost done. Sickle cell trait, the last handout. All right. Again, the NCAA requires that I educate you about sickle cell trait. It's a lifelong condition where one has inherited one gene for sickle hemoglobin and one for normal hemoglobin. During intense exercise, intensity is the key, the red blood cells containing the sickle hemoglobin, they change sh shape and accumulate in the bloodstream and block normal blood flow, which can lead to quite a bit of distress um, and also can result in death. That's a lovely sound. Um, the primary complaint is extreme weakness, okay? So it's a little bit different than the heat cramp, which is excruciating pain, and probably many of us have experienced that. They often happen during the night, right? Um, again, that's, that's electrolytes and hydration. But uh, with a sickle cell, that cramping, just feel, the legs will feel like jello. They'll feel really weak. So you have been obligated, again, by the NCAA to either let us know if you have sickle cell trait or not, or, or waive that, um, and most of you have waived it, so we don't necessarily know who has sickle cell trait or not. Um, prevention is, uh, you know, a slow and gradual progression, so that's smart for everybody. If all of a sudden you do an intense exercise, you do a fitness test, something that is really kind of an all-out effort, and you haven't prepared yourself for that, you are at risk if you have sickle cell trait. Even if you don't, you're at risk for other things. Um, asthma and altitude um, and dehydration all increase your susceptibility to having a sickle cell trait episode. Okay, I get a lot of questions on recovery. Everybody wants to know how to recover after a hard workout. How do you get ready for a second one um, the next day or if you're in a tournament situation when you have another contest even the same day? It is the basics. It is nutrition. It's recovery nutrition. I've talked um, before about how after a workout you have a window of opportunity where your body is most, um, is best at reabsorbing um, carbohydrates and protein. Uh, like chocolate milk is kind of the right ratio of carbohydrate protein. And it's about a, a 30 minute window after exercise where if you're having a bagel with peanut butter or you're having some OJ or you're having chocolate milk, you're helping refuel your muscles with glycogen so they're ready for the next bout. Um, so nutrition is huge, hydration is, is huge. Um, there's contrast showers where you're alternating hot and cold showers for 30 seconds hot, 30 seconds cold, and doing that three to five times. That can be kind of rejuvenating to your muscles. Don't scald yourselves, but hot and cold. 
Um, sleep is highly restorative and I think um, kind of underrated and really an important part of your recovery process as well. Stretching lightly and moving easily um, can also just give your muscles a chance to recover. And you know, with the, with the w heat we had last week, um, I want to talk about replacing electrolytes. If you're, sw you know, the, our, our body's main mechanism for cooling itself down is sweating. So one, you need to have fluids to sweat. Um, two, if it's really humid, then the, that it, the evaporation of that sweat is hampered because um, it's not just sweating that cools you, it's the evaporation of the sweat. So you need those two things happening. Um, and we lose, you lose mostly fluid, so water is a big one. But if it's been like it was a few days ago, you got to do more than replace water and you have to replace electrolytes as well. So I call this my Beyond Bananas, okay? Um, Beyond Bananas, orange juice, coconut water has a very similar electrolyte um, makeup to our bodies. Leafy greens, including spinach and kale, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, honey, peanut butter and, and nuts. Chocolate milk is great, yogurt is great, tomatoes, olives, beans, pumpkin seeds, I could go on and on. Basically, you're trying to prevent, I mean, um, replace magnesium, sodium, chloride, and potassium are the key ones. So th there's lots of other ways besides bananas, so I just want to throw that out as well. Are there any questions on anything? Okay, so again, I just encourage you, I hope you all have healthy, happy, successful seasons, but if something is bothering you and an issue, please don't hesitate to stop by and talk to someone on my staff about it, all right? Make sure you've signed. Everyone um, sign one of the sheets that's going around. Pass them to the aisles this way and I'll come collect them.